one of the first times I ever saw myself in pop culture. It wasn't on television, it wasn't in film, it was in a Broadway show. I was like, I want to do that, I want to go to there. And I never looked back. There was a celebration of life. It was this idea of found tribe. It was so choreographed and so corny and so perfect. That world is so exciting for a kid, especially a kid who is struggling with identity. Tell me more about this. What is this world? How do I get to there? The gayest thing in the world and I love it. This is the AV Club's Why We Love, an examination into the sometimes subconscious reasons we're drawn to our pop culture obsessions. For this Pride edition, celebrities and thought leaders share their love of musicals, from the first they ever saw to the ones that gave them their voice. Even before they found their community, these shows gave young LGBTQ people a place to be loud and proud. This is why we love Pride Edition. I think my first musical love was Annie, just because I saw it when I was like six years old, and I, I was just in awe of like how cool it could be to just be cleaning and wearing rags. I guess coming from like, you know, a low-income immigrant family, like we didn't have luxuries of just going to the theater. So I thought when I watched Annie on TV, because it was a Christmas special, and I just remember seeing it, I was like, wow, I've, I had never seen a musical, like ever in my life. <laughs> Wow, they're singing and dancing. Oh, and I remember looking at my mom and I said, Mom, I want to be that. I want to be an orphan. And she looked at me weird. And I was just like, what? And she said, ¿Qué? ¿Qué dices? And I was like, yeah, I want to be an orphan like them on TV. And she said, no, son actores, they're actors. And I was like, oh, then I want to be that. I want to be an actor. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to go to there. And um, I never looked back. I remember seeing uh, the major motion picture Xanadu on television when I was a very small child. And it was full of things that, you know, usually I just like the things that my mom told me to like. But Xanadu was full of like 70s pop and Olivia Newton-John and like a shiksa on roller skates and was not something she was interested in. And I, as just a very small child, was just like, tell me more about this. What is this world? How do I get to there? In the moment that I knew that movie, like musicals in general and people singing and girls wearing certain outfits was for me, was the Kate Capshaw scene in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom when she opened with Anything Goes. Anything Goes. <laughs> and I was like, I am it was like beautiful. It was so choreographed and so corny and so perfect. And I was like, this is very real. Anything goes. All of that world is so exciting for a kid, especially a kid who is struggling with identity. Most of my world was telling me, you know, explicitly and implicitly to tone the me that I know down and play up this part that everyone else is playing, right? So when you are a kid and you start doing theater, particularly musical theater, you're surrounded by people who have no interest in toning it down. And then you also found like your tribe, like I don't know, some of my closest friends through musicals, doing them in school. And you also found other people who were discovering who they were. And musicals were like the, the threshold of like one foot in, one foot out because they felt comfortable on stage, but not fully comfortable in their own skin to come out and be their true authentic queer self. Theater welcomed you into a group of people who were like, hey, it's safe here. It's safe to be you. Even if we're not all necessarily queer, we are all in this world where we're accepting, we're artists and we welcome you. Join us, come and waste an apple or two. I love Broadway and I love what Broadway does and I love the idea of what musicals do and the stories that theater tells and there's so many different ridiculous things about Broadway that find some through line for queer people. We see some other softer dimension of ourselves that, you know, certain genres afford. Like, 
you know, the concept of the musical or musical theater where everybody sings and everybody is emoting something, you know, that might not be normal in any sense of the word, right? People breaking out in a song to express their feelings, you know, just that deviation from that scene of normalcy of the way that people usually conceal, you know, their deepest, darkest thoughts and their sentiments open something up, I think, for those of us who feel really shy about what our emotional expression is going to be. And then you were, you were given permission to dance? My gay head exploded. One singular sensation, every little step she takes. What? Like I could sing and dance and this is a job? <laughs> okay, where do I sign up for that? You know, there's even a character in a chorus line who is a gay Puerto Rican dancer. But you know, again, that was one of the first times I ever saw myself in pop culture. It wasn't on television, it wasn't in film, it was in a Broadway show. Grasp it, sense it, tremble, it. The Phantom of the Opera, to be perfectly honest, was somebody who as a kind of young teen like wanting to love and to be loved, but not understanding themselves in a scene of love in a really clear way. The Phantom is basically like kind of this arrested adolescent who just, you know, wants Christine to love him, who wants to use his talents and his abilities to get people to be drawn to him and to, to want to be with him. As someone who didn't fit within certain categories of attractiveness, in high school, in part because of my race, uh, but also because I was, you know, struggling with my sexuality, even though I wasn't even honest about it to myself. And so the Phantom for me was just this way of working through those fears of being hideous to people in some way, but then reaching out to them with what I knew I had, and that was my ability to make music and song and those sorts of things. The Phantom of the Opera is there. My first love of a musical was The Phantom of the Opera. Somewhere in that whole storyline, I knew I wanted to be a performer and I started to connect with it all. And I was like, oh, right, I, I want to do this. I want to be a Phantom or I want to be a Christine or I want to be a Maria. And, run away with nuns, or I want to be, you know, I was trying to figure out where I could fit into all of it. I guess all the things that I love about the musicals were things that I identified with or wanted to identify with. When Spring Awakening came out, and it was like, whoa, crazy. Like, you know, it's like, oh, they're like, sex on stage? And I just remember like seeing like the show and just thinking this is so weird because it's like, I love musicals. Also, they're teenagers. Also, like I'm a teenager. Also, they're having sex on stage. Also, I want to have sex, maybe not on stage but I like this, you know? This can't be it. Oh God, what a bitch. There are very few artists who understand the human experience better than Stephen Sondheim. Everything's coming up roses. Sondheim freed me. Then I understood so much of, about love and about life in general. And you know, Stephen Sondheim is a prophet. <laughs> I'm drawn to his, his storytelling and how that happens on a sonic scale. The way that Sondheim challenges the audience, challenges the singers and performers. Pardon me, is everybody there? Because if everybody's there, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding. I'd appreciate you going even more. I mean, you must have lots of better things to do and not a word of it to Paul. Remember Paul, you know the man I'm with? Ugh. Sorry. So it's basically uh, a desire to like, love and create something beautiful, but then also have it not be easy. I remember the first time I heard Into the Woods and understood things about my relationship with my father that I didn't understand until I heard certain songs. No more riddles, no more jests, no more curses you can't undo left by fathers you never knew. I mean, how lucky are we? He could have just been a, you know, a psychologist or a therapist, but instead he created art that was transformative for many of us. And there's also something about like the peculiarity of, of some of the music that, that, that Sondheim writes that's just also so honest. That patter, like the, the, the pattern of patter 
to his songs says a lot. And if we think way back to, you know, when he wrote the lyrics to West Side Story, when you think about Somewhere. Someday, somewhere, we'll find a new way of living. That is a gay anthem, and that fundamentally is why I think, you know, through these years, not just because Sondheim himself is a gay icon, but but why, you know, thematically his music promised that place for us. I think they meant it when they said you can't buy love. Now I know you can rent it, and at least you are my love. Rent was the first show that told me that like, you know, I had been kind of force fed this message of I was going to die alone. And there was this idea that even though Rent was so sad and so beautiful and about a specific time in a gay men's lives uh, with uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, it still provided hope, even though the show was so depressing and so sad. There was a celebration of life. It was this idea of found tribe. The fact that I got to be a part of something as iconic and culture changing as rent is still something I marvel at. I still pinch myself, you know? In doing that show, understand on a whole new level the power of musical theater. To see young people during the late 90s, early 2000s come to this show to really reckon with their feelings about HIV and AIDS and the people that they lost and the lives that they had to lead because of the, the world we were living in at the time, which that show was a celebration and also a remembrance of people we lost for a decade. So I hear from people all the time about how that, sh that show be was a, a, a catharsis. That's the power of musical theater. I think sometimes we need the occasion to express ourselves and to be expressive. And especially if we feel for any reason that we have something to conceal, whether it's about how we feel inside about our gender or our sexuality, you know, I think that we're looking for those occasions or their opp opportunities to give us a model for expressing ourselves. And that's what so many of, I think, these iconic things that we love are about, these, you know, unabashed, forms of expression that we're all trying to get to or find, or maybe that we have already within, but are trying to seek a form. Viva la viva!